this first afternoon session and we have a workshop with Cornelia Zoltman. And uh, in this workshop, uh, she'll focus on her work in the exhibition, um, a series of video interviews uh, under the title Giving What You Don't Have. Uh, I won't say anything else about the work you can see there. Uh, on the screen, and Cornelia will say, I guess, uh, mm -hmm. even more. Um, Cornelia Zoltrank is an artist and researchers, a researcher living and working in Celle, Germany, and Dundee, Scotland. After studying fine art at the Academy of Fine Art in Munich and the University of the Arts in Hamburg, Zoltrank set out to explore the social and aesthetic implications of digital technologies. She's interested in the changing role of the artist in the information age. New forms of dissemination of art, gender-specific handling of technology, and communication and networking as art. Her work combines conceptual and performative approaches to become a research-based practice and to write practical theory. She was a member of the collective's found Mertesni and Inen. Uh, and initiated the cyber feminist alliance known as Old Boys Network. In 2011, she completed a practice based PhD at the University of Dundee. Her, her thesis, titled Performing the Paradoxes of Intellectual Property, made a critical contribution to the discourse in intellectual property from an art perspective. Since 2012, Zoltan is lecturer and researcher at Duncan of Jordan Stone College of Art and Design of Dundee. She is webmaster of artwares.org. Okay. Before I came here, it's about 90% of my favorite artists who are here. So <laughs> it's really exciting. Thank you. It's a great event. Um, the workshop uh, is titled If Art Were Commons. And um, during lunch break, I mean, we had the, the Marcel's workshop in the morning. During lunch break, I was talking to some people. If, they understood what was going on, what we said, and I kind of I had the impression as well. Also, I would say I'm kind of half into this scene, if I want to call it a scene, and I'm half in, not completely, not completely out. But it seemed to me that it is it is in a way a kind of a, a closed scene where you where it's also an established code of communication, a code of record, a kind of a set of references that you either know or you don't know. You either can decipher them. And I'm mentioning this because part of what I'm trying to do with my project is to understand what do that sort of practices have to do with the art world, with an exhibition format, with the role of an artist. And um, what I'm doing is, with this workshop and also with the project, is trying to also, first of all, understand myself what these projects are, what really interests me in those projects, and what sort of what kind of art they possibly uh, represent, and what kind of problems um, that implicates. So, uh, the, also, I, I had hoped for, for a more workshop kind of situation. This is still, I, I removed some, some chairs in the break to make it a little bit a bit closer together. Uh, usually a workshop, you know, for me is in a circle and people introduce themselves so that everyone knows who's present and what everyone's interest is. I have the feeling that's a bit, I don't know, too much or not the right thing to do. So still, I will present some things. Uh, I will even read out some things to you. Uh, I'll show some excerpts from the videos, which are also part of the exhibition. But I also would like to ask, well not just show the material, but also kind of provide some questions, maybe questions that I have, but that 
I would like to share with you, or I would like to answer, get your answers. So, ideally, it would be um, an interactive session in which you talk more than, than I do. So please feel encouraged. I know it's a bit difficult because I think we're supposed to use a microphone as well because of the recording. Still, um, let's, let's try. So if you have ideas, if you want to make contributions, please feel free to interrupt any time and do it. So bringing together art and commons is a difficult and risky thing. If it is possible at all and how this could or should happen is what I want to discuss with you today. This workshop is based on my interest in getting a better understanding if certain principles and values which have successfully been implemented in free software culture can be related or connected in a meaningful way to the concept of art. Not talking about putting a creative, I'm not talking about putting a Creative Commons license on a digital work. This interest, this interest has led me to the larger idea of the commons for which property relations and the quality of social relations with regards to the resources are central. One difficulty of this undertaking may lie in the fact that for many aspects of art, property is still a very important feature. First, a very powerful art market is based on selling commodities and has a huge influence on socially acceptable definitions of art. Secondly, even if artists are not involved in the production of commodities, they are still trapped in the economy of intellectual property, reflected in the reputation economy, which largely focuses on individuality and novelty. After all, the whole concept of intellectual property has been born from the genius creator and the originality of his work. These two concepts are still resonating in almost concepts of art and I'm kind of saying this in the beginning because I think even in these what we see here exhibitions, understandings of arts, uh, role models for artists, it's, it's still resonating and present. So in the center of this workshop will be a project which I've been working on a bit more than a year now. It's called Giving What You Don't Have. Um, so, on the basis of interviews conducted as part of the artistic research project, giving what you don't have, the workshop will introduce and discuss art projects whose aim is to contribute to the, to the production and preservation of the commons. And that's the sort of a definition that I kind of laid over all the projects, and, and if you disagree, then <laughs> please let me know. Fundamental questions will include the relation between art and commons. What forms of organization artists suggest? What values represent their projects? What forms of agency do the projects exemplify? <coughs> what forms of social relations do they enable, activate or produce? Where are the projects located? What role does technology play in those projects? What external economies do the projects depend on? Whose labor are they based on? Important question, which I also wanted to add to what you were saying this morning, not only about the digital comments and the relation to uh, their material basis, but also uh, their role or the labor aspect. So who is actually producing all these goods under what conditions? So what are the working conditions? What do the projects actually produce? Who profits from those projects? What are the property relations involved? And one thing that I realized thinking about these projects, there are different, let's say, layers of property relations because very often the, the projects um, provide a certain infrastructure or a tool that makes <coughs> knowledge available. But, and usually the, the intellectual property aspect is related to 
to the knowledge that's provided or, or access provided to. But I think we should also extend it and think about the property relation with regards actually to the infrastructures, to have a look at the infrastructures. Who has access, who has control over those structures and how open and transparent are they? And last but not least, what inherent conception of art do they express? And I just want to throw some of, you know, if I talk about conceptions of art, some phrases or terms into the room, which have been kind of at least in the neighborhood of, of what, we, what, we, uh, what we, what's presented in this exhibition. Things like relational art, socially engaged art, social practice, participatory art, and things like that. And I have to say, for me, what I see here is way beyond all that and uh, the theory that will kind of encompass or kind of describe uh, the, the sort of works that I see here and that I'm interested in doesn't exist yet so it still needs to be written. So the question I, I, have, I have formulated and read out to you are just a few questions which I'm interested in. And I'm sure and I hope that during the discussion we are having on the basis of, of the interviews that probably much more questions involve. So, so far um, I have published um, I have published six interviews um, on a website. Um, maybe I'll tell us a little bit the, the story of the project. It was a commission by the Gufana Post Media Lab they gave me a little bit of money to kind of start uh, producing the interviews and because it was um, funded through them I had to uh, I had to put the website on the post media my, my, my material on the post media lab website the post media lab ended in meanwhile and uh, the website cannot be modified or accessed anymore so I, I was way too slow nowadays projects you know they kind of push through in a year or two and I, you know I take my so uh, there is not really a home page which is fully functioning with regards to the project. The videos are all on Vimeo and this new uh, home, home page which I will create on my own server and that makes um, uh, not only the videos accessible but also searchable and provides contextualizing material uh, will be made in the next months only. Um, another thing is, when I started this project, uh, I talked to people post media lab, I said, I have this idea, I want to make interviews, I'm interested in... Um, but basically this work is a continuation of my PhD, which five years uh, it had to title Performing the Paradoxes of Intellectual Property, and it was very much focusing on, on our practices that draw on and build on uh, already existing material to rework, to process, to appropriate in various ways. And uh, of course, that these sort of practices produce or prefer the paradoxes of intellectual property, because actually intellectual property is there to enable, at least in theory, and foster uh, artistic practice and creativity, but when it comes to those sort of practices, it's actually harming and hindering. So, because uh, I experienced an act of censorship myself, I started to get interested in understanding or getting a deeper understanding what's actually those sort of practices I'm interested in, I'm doing myself, and in copyright. And that made me embark on a long story, which was quite interesting, going back in history, seeing how copyright and aesthetic theory uh, had a mutual influence from the beginning on, and how central concepts of both uh, of copyright, art, authorship, and originality as they are in aesthetic theory. So that's a, two things that are really closely connected and that's why practices that question copyright or that kind of uh, lead to some sort of copyright infringement, they automatically <coughs> tell you that there is also a kind of a, a move away from aesthetics or understandings of art as represented in traditional aesthetics. So having you know, worked with this for five years, I always 
felt a little bit uncomfortable and I thought it's not really right to the point. It was all interesting, but I thought, well, something is really missing. And only after I had finished, I realized um, in all these discussions and remakes and appropriation and so on and so forth, they are based on the assumption that the artist is, has a, must have a privileged <coughs> situation in society. An artist must have access to, to everything. They want to. So that means it's based on this, yeah, the artist being a super user. And and in the end, if you see what they do, artists take things, like remix things, make it into their own artworks. Uh, there's remix culture, which is a bit more broader culture, but kind of uh, what's often mentioned as references like appropriation art. If you look at what the appropriation art did. They were very radical at just taking, appropriating things that existed and basically making it into private property. That's what happened with appropriation art. So that shows where this discourse is very, is very limited and it, it tells you uh, not to only to ask the question what can artists take and artists should have artistic freedom to do whatever they want to, but kind of turning the question around a little bit and asking um, what could actually, what could artists contribute to a discourse or to, to a kind of circulation of knowledge and, and to this whole a discourse which is more than just leading to other forms of enclosures and private property. So uh, this kind of insight, what kind of this new question of what can artists contribute led me to Kind of my interest in this project that uh, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of researching and looking into and giving what you don't have. And even when I started, I was not entirely sure. I didn't have like precise criteria. Just the, some projects I was interested in, and um, it's still evolving. So I was in the lucky situation that Post Media Lab were very generous, and I didn't have to come up with the precisely defined goals and outputs and all that thing. So it gave, it gave me the freedom just to go from one to the next and reflect on what are actually the criteria I'm interested in. And basically the, where I am at the moment, what I'm interested in are <coughs> projects that provide some sort of infrastructure or tools that kind of make knowledge accessible or contribute to the production or preserving of commons in the, in the widest sense. So that might also imply that there is a certain symbolic value, but this functionality is a very important aspect I would like to emphasize. So talking about art and commons, um, I realized recently that when I talk to people about commons and ask them what is actually their definition of commons. Uh, I think every, every person I talk to gives me pretty much a different definition. So it seems to be like a new kind of projection field for all kind of private and political and whatever religious fantasies. Even it's like meant to solve all problems. And very, very seldom you, 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 kind of, you kind of have really precise definitions that would help you to kind of have a really more focused uh, discussion or you know, political discussion. So just to be a bit more precise, precise uh, about, you know, what I would suggest when we talk about commons, what that is. Um, I would like to refer to uh, a definition that was suggested by Massimo de Angelis. I don't know he, if he's known. He's a professor of political economy and development at the University of East London. He's a co-director of Center for Social Justice and Change and founder and editor of the web journal The Commoner. And he basically gives a three-part definition of the commons which I find very interesting and helpful. He says the first part of the comment is actually pooled resources. That means non-commodified means of fulfilling people's needs. So you have some sort of resources. The second part or the second element is the community. A community
community that creates and sustains the resources, a set of commoners who share those resources and who define for themselves the rules through which they are accessed and used. And I think community, uh, well, I think for some people that's another almost religious uh, term for others. They kind of completely turn away. I think community can be understood in a, in a quite loose way. It must not be a local community or anything, but it's a community of people who, who talk to each other and try to establish like a common set of values and references, I would say. And thirdly, so the resources, the community, and thirdly, he, he, he suggests commoning as active process, which means the creation and reproduction of the commons, and with it the word to common, to common. So I think these three elements are pretty helpful if we talk about also and think about the relationship between art and the commons. So we have a pooled resource, we have a community who kind of establishes their own rules and, and this activity of commoning, which means producing or preserving the commons. So if we have this kind of definition of commons and bring it, think it together, this is basically what I'm suggesting, what we do when we look at the workshop. We, we look at the specific project and see what is their kind of, what, what are the resources, how are they produced, what are kind of the rules uh, for access and who kind of has um, control over the infrastructure so can inf influence the forum and so on and so forth. I think that might be pretty, um, pretty productive. Um, a few things more. Uh, I said I have six interviews online for today. I, I will mainly focus on three. I, would, I was about to, to include Marcel, but I think he's highly overrepresented. So I will just um, show a very short few minutes at the end where he's talking about the relation um, to the art world of, the, of what he's doing, which is pretty interesting because it shows the whole ambivalence of kind of being an artist or using art as a concept for kind of realizing the project and the strategy, let's say, that's behind it and probably also the... Huh? No, I'm afraid. You're afraid. I can't remember what I said. <laughs> yeah, that's why I make the video interviews, so which everyone can see and remember afterwards. But we, I, I can also delete it if you don't want to, anyone. <laughs> it doesn't mean it's, 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 it must be there forever, but it's kind of a good, you know, I think it's good material to, to really generate this necessary discussion. Like what, you know, why is this sort of art in, in an exhibition context at all? You know? Does, it, does the exhibition context need this sort of art, or is it art for both, or, or mutually? So what's the dynamics behind this, or, or even also the, the, the economy in this? So uh, what I'm going to show is excerpts of Kenneth Goldsmith's work, of Jean, who is also still here, if he doesn't, didn't run away, meanwhile. <laughs> um, Jean, and also Femke. Um, and I asked Femke particularly to kind of contribute a little bit more about the gender aspects involved because as most of the projects are very closely associated, I would say, to the hacker context and to a certain approach to technology which is highly gendered as we know, I thought it would add a lot of value to the quality of the whole discussion if we would address this uh, issue as well, and um, and one thing. So we have the comments, we have gender aspect, but um, and last but not least, kind of the relationship between comments and and the artwork. Can there be a, a meaningful, a good, you know, productive relationship? And if so, how how would that need to would need have to look like? So having said that, I think we should. I'm going to start with the first interview. Um, it's kind of Goldsmith. Um, I'll, I'll only screen a few excerpts from all of the uh, interviews.
they are in full length online and the, the, what I'm showing here, what we're discussing, we should just kind of, for those who don't know them, already encourage you to, to really go online and take the time um, to have a look. Um, generally, I mean, these interviews, they are not like in-depth research interviews, they are mainly meant really to introduce the project and make some sort of background information available to, to a larger audience. So that's you know coming back to to, to the, my first sentences about like an insider community. I think this project could be like um, uh, an, also like a project that communicates, contextualizes some some of the stuff that's going on here. A few introductory work about uh, words about Uhu Webb and Ken Goldsmith, who is about to become a superstar. <laughs> 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 Uh, well, he's not as famous as Andy Warhol yet, but I think he's not famous. <laughs> so, Kenneth Goldsmith is a New York based uh, poet, writer, educator, and founder of Ubu Web, an online repository of avant garde art. His artistic practice is based on the idea that nothing new needs to be created. The gathering and appropriation of pre existing material, which is the mode of archiving has become the new mode of creating as well, as he claims. As a writer, Goldsmith has published a number of books of poetry, notably Sports, Traffic, The Weather, Day, and Fidget, Fidget which are transcriptions of newspapers or radio or television broadcasts. So, transcriptions. His book of essays, Uncreative Writing, challenges the romantic notion of individual expression as the basis of creativity and suggests that a new creativity is not making, but pointing and selecting. <coughs> By discussing techniques such as rearranging, remixing, recombining, quoting, letterizing, etc., he unfolds the creative potential inherent in the already written. As a professor of English literature, Goldsmith teaches the art of uncreative writing as a way of managing language by investigating current digital-based changes of the reading and writing culture and of developing inadvertently new and probably rather creative ways of writing. He celebrates the plasticity of the work which gained new hates through digital network technology. And maybe you have seen, I mean, there was, it was quite a, a lot circulated, this uncreative writing course and the book. Then his last coup that he landed last week is his new undergraduate course he's offering, which is called Wasting Time on the Internet. And um, uh, at least half a dozen of, of major newspapers in America picked up on that. So it's a very good self-promotion, I could say. His belief in the internet as the ultimate way of distribution also led him to create Ubu Web. Ubu Web is a massive collection of what Goldsmith calls avant-garde art, comprising thousands of works of concrete poetry, sound poetry, sound art, experimental film, multimedia archives, video, dance, and a variety of other genres and formats. All works can be viewed online, online and downloaded. The collection has been put together by Goldsmith purely on the basis of his personal appreciation and is accessible for everyone for free. What characterizes the web is that almost that most of its content is hard to find elsewhere, being out of print or simply never being made available for wide dissemination. Therefore, the archive has an important function not only in the contextualizing of ephemeral works but also in preserving them. Google Web owes its existent, its existence and with it its success to a consequential abnegation of copyright. As the archive is running on zero budget, there are simply no resources for copyright clearance procedures. Thus, Google Web is as much about the legal and social ramifications of its self-created distribution and archiving system as it is about the content posted on the site. And now we let him speak. Well, I started in 1996. 
and it began as a site for visual and concrete poetry. And with it was a mid-century genre <coughs> typographical. and it began as a site for visual and concrete poetry, and which was a mid-century genre of typographical poetry. Um, and I got a scanner, and I scanned a concrete poem, and I put it up on Hulu, and in those days, uh, it used to, the images used to come in as interlaced, skin, every other line filling in. So really, it was an incredible thing to watch this poem kind of grow uh, organically, and it looked exactly like concrete poetry that always wanted to look, a little bit of typographical movement, and I thought, oh, this is perfect. And also because the concrete poetry is so flat and modernist, when it was illuminated from the back by the uh, computer screen, it looked beautiful and graphic and flat and clean, and suddenly it was like, ah, oh, this, uh, this is the perfect medium for concrete poetry, which I really adore, and still is very much a part of Ubu. And then, uh, a few years later, real audio came, and I began to put up uh, sound poetry. And, you know, little sound files of sound poetry, so you know, you could look at the concrete poetry and listen to the sound poetry. And a few years later, you had a little more bandwidth, and we began to put up videos, so this is the way that the, the, the site grew. But also, what happened on Uvu was a, a, an odd thing, because it was concrete poetry. So I put up the poems of John Cage, the concrete misostics of John Cage. And then I got a little bit of sound of John Cage reading some of these things. And suddenly, it was Cage reading a misostic with a, uh, with a, with a uh, orchestra behind him. And I said, wait a minute, this is no longer sound poetry. This is something else. And I thought, what is this? And it's, I said, ah, it's ah, my God. <laughs> and so from there, the whole thing, because of Cage and Cage's practice, the whole thing became a repository and archive for the avant-garde, which it is today. So that's how it moved from being specifically concrete poetry in 1996 to today being all avant-garde. I don't know anything. I'm a poet. I'm not a historian. I'm not an academic. I don't know anything. I just get a sense of oh, that might be interesting. That sort of feels avant-garde. I mean, it's ridiculous. It's terrible. I'm the wrong person to do this. But, you know, nobody stopped me. And, and so I've been, I've been doing it. You know, I just, it's just, you know, anybody can do it. It's very hard to have something on Google, and that's why it's so good. Uh, you know, that's why it's not archive.org, where everything can go, and there are good things there, but there's nobody working as a gatekeeper to say, oh, this is better. Actually, this is better than that. And I think one of the problems with net culture, or the web culture, is that we've decided to suspend judgment. We can't say that one thing is better than another thing, because everything's equal. 
And I, there's part of me that really likes that idea, and it creates fabulous chaos. But I think it's sort of a curatorial job to go in and make sense <coughs> of some of that chaos. And in a very small way, that's what I try to do on Google Web. In a very, you know, I mean, it's just, it's, it's, it's the avant-garde, it's, you know, it's not, it's not a big, not a big project, it's a, a rather small slice of culture that one can have a point of view. I'm not saying it's right, it's probably very wrong, but nobody else is doing it, so I figure, you know, but by virtue of the fact that there's only one Ubu web, it's become institutional. And the reason that there is only one Ubu web is that Ubu web <coughs> ignores copyright. And everybody else, of course, is afraid of copyright. So there should be hundreds of Ubu webs. It's ridiculous that there's only one. But everybody else is afraid of copyright, so that nobody will put anything on. We, we just act like copyright doesn't exist. Yeah. Copyright, what's that? Never heard of it. <laughs> I understand people get nervous. They, they would prefer me to ask. But if I ask, I couldn't have built this on. Because if you ask, you start negotiation, you make a contract, you need lawyers, you need permissions, and then if, 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 if something has a, uh, a film has a, a set, uh, has music in the background by the Rolling Stones, you have to clear the rights with the Rolling Stones and pay them a little bit of money. And, and you know, licenses. Yeah, I couldn't do that. I do this with no money. That would take millions. To do Uber with permission the right way, correctly, would take millions and millions of years. And I built this whole thing for nothing, zero money. So you know, if you know, I think I'd love to be able to ask for permission and do things the right way. It's a, it's a, it's it is the right way to do things. But it wouldn't be possible to make an archive like this that way. It's like. It's Web 1.0. I write everything in HTML by hand, code, hand coded like I did in 1996. Same, BB Edit, same program. But it's searchable. Yeah, it's got like a dumb, you know, little, you know, pay, you know, a little free search engine. I don't, I don't do anything. You see, this is the thing. For many, many years, people would always come up to me and say, "We'd like to put Uber Web in a database," and I said, "No, no, no, no." It's working really well as it is. And, you know, imagine if Ubu had been locked up in some sort of horrible SQL database. I, I couldn't, you know, the, and, the, and the administrator of the database walks away, the guy that knows all that stuff walks away with the keys, which always happens. No, 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 this way it's free, it's open, it's simple, it's backwardly compatible, it always works. Um, I like the simplicity of it. it. It's no different than it was 17 years ago. It's really dumb. But it does what it does very well. If you work on something for an hour a day for 17 years, two hours, three hours, you come up with something really substantial. The web is very ephemeral, and Ubu Web is just as ephemeral. It's amazing that it's been there for as long as it has, but tomorrow it could vanish. I could get sued. I could get bored. Maybe I'll just walk away and blow it up. I don't know. What do I need to keep doing all this work for? So if you find something on the internet that you love, don't assume it's going to be there forever. Download it. Always make your own archive. Don't ever assume that it's waiting there for you because it won't be there when you look for it. Fuck the cloud. Fuck the cloud. Okay, I think that was enough to kind of communicate. The main aspects. Um, I, re I really would like you to come in now and, and comment, you know, or kind of discuss the projects. I think some aspects which have become very clear that it's, it's very much based on this personal appreciation, effort, investment, uh, also risk taking, um, judgment, things like that. Did you want to say anything? No, no, I want to carry on. <laughs> Please. I can't see if two 
Dushan is here, so yeah, Dushan is not here. Pity, because that would kind of uh, probably like uh, wake him up. So, because <laughs> uh, that uh, what I what I like, the, the, there is another project. It's also exhibited here. It's monoscope. It's uh, I, I really like what how Ken is like putting that in work, saying like uh, if you do for a certain number of years some work, then it becomes substantial. And then it's like individual, that one can do that. And then there is also, you mentioned before, that community as aspect. And uh, many times, again, because we understand uh, all of the myths uh, and the mythology around like authorship and the individuality, individual genius and all of that, I think that Ken is almost the only one who can seduce us to trust him you know, because the world is saying beautiful most of the time, things like that. So it's kind of he can cheat on that. And I, I, I was trying to make that argument also, just like as a question. With mono, monoscope is, is again, mostly like uploads are done by one guy, Dushan Barak. He would complain, it's pity that he's not here. He would say, no, that's not because he not. But in a way, it's again like, a, so that's what I'm interested in. So there is that. There is that obviously very wrong myth and mythology around the individual, but then why don't we have that many ubus? And I don't think that it's only because I don't think that Ken is the only one who is not afraid of copyright. Then uh, at least there is Dushan who did great. I mean, yeah. In another interview, you would hear Kenneth would say just the same that he loves monoscope more than ubu. <laughs> and, and, and things like that. So that's what I'm also interested in, that relation in between like uh, how that happens, why there not more. Uh, um, is, is it part of the, how, of the search algorithm, social search algorithm, or is it really that it doesn't happen? I okay. would like to add something. Yeah. Because it would be one of my, my uh, questions that Google Chrome is so long there. Maybe the basic reason is uh, because it's the only one. Uh, well, it would have become something which is connected with the structure of the market which uh, could promise a higher profit by ignoring uh, copyright then even more would have appeared and then again then the story would start about the laws it's quite interesting that this unique, uh, this unique character is also part of the protection child around I would say so. Uh, yeah, I would say nowadays artists are asking if they get the permission to make an upload on Google. It's, it's, it's the opposite way around. Uh, nowadays uh, artists uh, who are quite established artists and living from the gallery stuff, uh, making video art, are interested to be visible in the surrounding. But may I quickly comment? So, are you trying to say that uh, it's because he enforce, enforces kind of quite strict quality criteria that he built a thing that's gained such a reputation that now people want actually their work to have on it? Yes. Which is, yeah. So, uh, well, yes, maybe that, that's true, but I'm, I still think it's in a way questionable because. I mean, we all like it, and all the work I'm doing is really because I, I, I appreciate those projects, but I think they also need a, a really critical discussion. And I think with relation to WikiLeaks, someone called WikiLeaks a single person organization. And I think Ubu is pretty much the same, even if there may be some people in the background operating and doing some things. But the question is really how, you know, what exactly then is yeah, for me, then it's more an artwork than kind of a distributed uh, inf infrastructure or something like that. I think there is still an issue that needs to be addressed. Sebastian? I mean, I would want to challenge this idea that Ubu Web is a one of a kind thing, and that even though there should be thousands of others, there are none. And I mean, Ken Goldsmith himself knows that quite well that there are countless of these others. I mean, one of the, one of the, one of the most, most, uh, Memorable things that I've heard him heard him say was that he calls archiving the new folk art in a way. There's this practice of archiving that's kind of a new practice, a new a new practice of producing because the means of archiving 
are much more accessible than they have been, let's say, 20 or 40 years ago. Um, of course, there are many, many more uh, Ubu Web Lab uh, uh, projects and activities, just many of them are not so well visible. The ones that are more, let's say, technologically advanced are usually uh, more in the gray, darker gray, blackish areas on the web. They may be behind logins, they're uh, hidden, they're private. They're much, much, much more functional than Ubu Web. But the, the, the thing with Ubu Web, and he knows that quite well himself, it's persistence. It's doing the same thing for 15 years. And at some point, that, become, that becomes an institution, that can become an institution. And then it really matters, I mean, and, but that's more a matter of maybe aesthetics or ethics, and, and up, to which point, up to which point this is, int this is an interesting project or not so much proponent of this kind of idea that the success of a course, university course, should be measured by international newspaper <laughs> or by national newspaper articles about it. It's a new school of how you, how, you, how you think that something you do in academia is a success by credit. Maybe there's a cutoff point at some, at some point, but, um, but uh, you know, it's a, it's a good niche, it's precise, and I think it's mostly I mean, if Ubu Web became the one, or one of the online archives that uh, will remain in memory, then it's really mostly persistence and not changing things for a long time. Even though now, maybe things have changed. Well, regarding this online course, I I, I see I see that they're kind of this is kind of running a double a double strategy where he on the one hand kind of builds his archive and, and, and with the archive provides a service to its users. On the other hand, he kind of performs very much as, as, a, as a genius artist. And the interesting way for me is how he kind of brings those two elements together because they basically, um, they basically represent two different notions of art. And I think it's a very smart way that he kind of uses you know, the one basically what the, what the art world asks from him to be this kind of brilliant, funny, ironic, smart guy that he uses that in a performative way to also protect his archive and the infrastructure that it's making. It's just one of the, the aspects. Any other comment? Um, I mean, the, the one thing is, is maybe and we should separate. The one thing is the message saying, copy what, I just do that, I don't care. And maybe to encourage, to be more courageous in doing so. And I also would say there, I mean, it was a very early project, but I also see that this is, there are more things, like, like archives you can, can, uh, that you can use as a, as a source or that you can produce yourself. The problem is that this, calling this curation, for example, I, this is a very conservative idea about curating. You know? it, it says, uh, this is my personal taste, and I don't, I don't, I mean, it's also very coquette, like saying I don't need any research or something like this, but, but it's a very irresponsible way of, of um, making a selection and just calling it, it's my personal taste, and then saying this is curating, so that would probably substitute to discuss, but um, but finally it's his private private project. It's, it's, uh, and that what, what you say when you ask uh, how, how people produce from other things uh, property, then it's in this case maybe not something he's selling, but it's an intellectual property he's producing in a certain way. What would that be? I mean the, the collection. The, I'm the curator of this selection of works, and so I'm. It's my. Um, that's what he's saying, actually. that uh, I need to work through, but I must say, have you seen this? I'm, I'm, with all my love for the archive, I'm a bit shocked. 
Uh, and uh, for two reasons, uh, maybe other people can uh, be more eloquent about that. First, I find it really irresponsible how he waves away uh, the asking for permission as a question of money. I think that's really sad that he goes, uh, asking for permission would be the right way. If I had the money, I would do it. I think that's really, uh, I find that quite sad. And the other is uh, that he puts uh, a false dichotomy, I think, uh, between the curated archive that he um, manages and uh, initiatives like archive.org. And I think there's, it's not either or, they really exist uh, next to each other. So his archive could not exist without archive.org and the other way around. So I think it's really, um, in the way he speaks about it, it's quite uh, harsh actually and quite violent how he makes these two uh, statements. So. so maybe one yeah. more and then we have to move on to Felix. Oh, really? <laughs> Sorry. I, I don't think that uh, indeed it's about Ubu and specifically Ubu word, like archive, about copyright or about property, the discussion. Because when, Ubu, uh, when the project arrived, it was the time that no one was collecting, that Ubu word was, was collecting. So I think it's, it's about to make uh, to, to to give visibility to some art from the 70s, specifically 70s, 60s, 80s, that the people doesn't start to collecting. But now even the institution imply in collecting this kind of art, they are not collecting like before, because this is like a second-hand kind of institution. We have in the market now this Qatar or something like that. This. 3,000 million euros a year of budget to buy new pieces or something, but then, then we have this European and some in the state or in Latin America, little museum that they are not really collecting uh, uh, authentic pieces, if I can say. They are collecting, they are just archiving things. So they are something they are discussing in the last 20 years about colonialism, <laughs> collective. Uh, and about how to archive, how to make a collection, something like that. I, th I think it will work right just in, in, in this moment. I don't think that you can collect it, Bill Viola pieces or st standard or something that is just in the top of the market, but you can collect it, all this kind of thing. And I think that for me, the meaning of who will is to be one of the first actors to give visibility to some kind of practice from the Senate or something like that. I don't think that it's always connecting because the when, when we are talking about art and copyright, of course I agree that this is uh, Duchamp, but we, can, we have a lot of examples historically, many, many examples. No, really, it doesn't exist credit common or copyright in the art practice. This is something that, that, that is very new and, and that now the government and some regulations try to regulate in the art practice. But it doesn't exist historically. I think this is uh, something that you must... The art is the place for freedom. This is something that uh, you don't need to care about. Uh, you are copying, you, we can see collapse in the, in, in the avant-garde in the 20s, in the 90s. And, uh, so, this is, uh, for me, it's a totally different discussion. It's not about profit or about copyright. I think we need to talk about this in more detail. <laughs> Yeah, Felix. Yeah. Um, I just want to add something on this irresponsibility of curating the way he does. I kind of like it because it's more the problem that he points out. To, I just do it the way I like it, and if you don't like it, whatever. And it's the same problem we have in all these communities, right? Because they're always kind of organized. They can, you know, do it inwards. So they say, look, maybe there are 10 people, maybe 100 people, but the, the type of argument is always the same. This is the way we do it, and uh, it works for us, it's great, and if you don't like it, why don't you do it, you do your own thing. And um, it's sometimes a bit more difficult to see, because in larger communities these are more complex discussions that arrive kind of at this conclusion, and for him it's very simple. <coughs> Well, it's no discussion, it's just him. But the kind of problematic and uh, the shift that's implied in this problematic towards kind of 
um, more traditional institutional ways of thinking about this, about you know, being sensitive, having a kind of an objective grid against which you organize your things, or something that is at least um, not purely personal. And uh, this shift, I think, is, is in, all these pro in all these projects, also the projects here, that you suddenly end up with stuff we like, rather than something that represents something that is, that is more, more, has a more kind of impersonal view. I'm not sure whether that's good or bad, but it's a very, I think, deep and general shift in how we organize uh, stuff. I think it's a good starting point, but then the question could be, what is this stuff that we like and why do we like it? Okay, so I would like to move on. How much late did we start? 20 minutes? We have time. That was my question. Okay. Um, so I would like to move on to the next art project, the next artist, who is also present. John Dockray. John Dockray is an artist whose work expands the notion of artistic production to the creation of open structures and unstable <coughs> situations. Such projects include, for example, various artist-run exhibition spaces, an educational project, and a library archive, which is also included in the exhibition here, Art Board. Originally from the U.S., he has traveled and lived on different continents in the last few years, always continuing to work on his core projects online. On the basis of his professional background in architecture and the broad understanding of what architecture involves, John explores how form and content mutually influence each other. In the projects he initiates, he provides a framework and basic rules that only come to life through the contributions of large numbers of people and which often yield unpredictable social relationships and dynamics. Also, the focus within my project, Giving What You Don't Have, is on the project Artwork, an open source platform for freely shared books and texts. Sean's primary interest lies in the appropriation of systems and structures such as gallery, library, or school, rather than simply content. In this interview, Jeanne explains how art work naturally involved as part of the self-organized educational <coughs> project known as the public school. The public school started in LA in 2008, if that's right, in the context of an artist-run gallery and has three core elements. First, the website through which courses are organized by the participants. Secondly, a real space component where people can meet. And thirdly, artwork as a resource. And the technical infrastructure being the engine for getting events to happen. Artwork, while being a central tool for the creation and sharing of knowledge within public school, produces project-related communities around their reading material. John points out how centralized business interests in general have changed the whole life cycle of a book, including production, distribution, and consumption, which all is now happening through internet-based platforms, and where art sits in relation to that development. So I see Arcus, uh, Arcus, John is sitting there in the back, maybe suffering a little bit. <laughs> um, please uh, let me know if you disagree with anything. I think that's really the good thing, that, uh, that we have the artists together that we really start a conversation and talk. So what I kind of said to introduce your work is a suggestion, maybe an interpretation from my side. Um, but, you know. I think you should do my lecture. <laughs> yeah, what's the theme? <laughs> the public school. Yeah, so people are prepared. So, um, again, um, I selected some excerpts from the interview. No download. I'm not interested. Oh, it's great to be I 
other personal interests had to do with personal motivation, had to do with running an art space for, at that point, four years. And actually seeing the act of putting on exhibitions, uh, for me, was less about sort of making value judgments and more about trying to contribute to the sort of cultural life of my uh, city and also provide opportunities that didn't exist um, in Los Angeles. For example, like no one really knew how to show work with technology. Uh, and we were able to because, like, you know, for instance, I knew how to set up projectors or fix electronics or get things to start and stop and that kind of stuff. Um, but over the course of running it, um, because it is an exhibition space, I, I found myself put into the role of um, being a curator. Uh, Fiona and I both did, and it was a kind of uncomfortable role to be sort of deciding what became visible and what wouldn't be. And one thing that was never visible was the sort of mechanisms by which an institution made certain things visible. So the public and the public school actually, uh, in a way, is trying to eliminate that whole apparatus, or at least like put that apparatus as, as something that we didn't want to be solely the ones sort of interacting with. We wanted that apparatus to be um, the thing that was, like, was sort of like, um, that the, our entire community, the community of people who is who be participating in the program, that they were the ones sort of responsible for. So, so that would shift sort of programming, but also accountability and all these things to the, the people who are actually participating in the, the life of the space. And you're in between the space, program, website, and audience. <coughs> it started out small. Um, in a way, it was um, kind of an extension of what I think is a practice that uh, all of us are familiar with, which is uh, sharing books that we've read, or sharing articles that we've read. Uh, especially if you've, um, you know, if your work is somehow in relationship to, um, to things that you might be reading. Right? Um, in my architecture school, for instance, we would read lots and lots. Uh, and then we'd be making work in parallel. And, um, and it wouldn't be that either would determine the other, but, you know, again, there's a, there's a, a strong relationship between, like, ideas that you have and what you see as possible and the things that you're reading. And so, yeah, as part of the student culture, especially among my my friends, uh, the people that I identified with in school, we would always, uh, you know, we'd be discovering different parts of the library independently. And then when we found something that, you know, uh, was quite moving in whatever way, then we would photocopy it to keep it for ourselves later. And we'd also give it to each other, you know, as a kind of, uh, um, yeah, as like a, secret tool or something like that, you know, like I, you have the sense that um, that when you found something that's really good, um, and especially if other people aren't even interested in it, you know, then you feel really uh, empowered by, by having access to that, and by being able to read it and reread it. And then you feel more empowered when there's a community of other people, it might be a small one, but you know, who have, who have uh, read that thing as well, because then you start building a kind of shared uh, uh, frame of reference, a shared vocabulary, and a shared way of seeing the world and seeing what you're working on. And I think out of that comes comes projects, like you actually work on projects together, you collaborate, uh, and you know, uh, you become whatever you correspond with other people, or you you actually share the work. And that's what had happened, was that um, uh, I started ARG after I moved from New York to Los Angeles, and so I was quite far away from some of the people that I was working with. And um, yeah, and just continuing with that, that very basic 
uh, act activity of sharing reading material in order to sort of um, have that shared vocabulary to be able to work together. Especially when I'm uh, involved in these kinds of projects, I don't like being alone. <laughs> um, you know, I mean, obviously, it contributes a lot to the work when there's not only because there's more people, but actually the kind of uh, kind of relationships and negotiations that happen in, in that work are interesting in themselves. Um, so anyway, it was never all that interesting for it to be a private library. I mean, we all have private libraries, but there's this potential uh, as well, which I think, yeah, wasn't part of the project uh, at the beginning. It really was a tool for, um, for sharing uh, in a particular kind of context. Uh, but I think, obviously, you know, once you, once, people saw it and they saw a sort of potential in it because, you know, you see what happens on the internet and you know, um, you know that in certain cases you can read from it and you can write to it, you know, <laughs> there's a, um, and you also know that uh, although there's kind of, there, there, there still is various forms of digital exclusion, uh, that it's quite accessible, um, you know, relative to other form, other libraries, like university libraries, for instance. It's not just about having access to certain material, but what is related to it, what's really important is like the dynamics of building a community and the context and, and mm. even uh, smaller discourses around certain issues. Which you don't have necessarily. You just download a text, and you have a text, but you don't have somebody to talk to, or you don't write your opinion yeah. about it to someone. So that's I think that what comes with the project, which makes it um, very valuable to a lot of people. Yeah, I mean that's going back to what I was saying about some of the some of the failures before the public school. Um, yeah, which was as the site was growing, as art was growing. Um, all of a sudden there'd be things on there that I didn't know about before, that someone felt uh, was important to share, and because someone felt it was important to share it, I felt it was important to read it. <laughs> um, and I did, but then I wanted to read it with other people. Um, yeah, and so some of those reading groups were, were, were always like um, attempts do you produce some social context for the, the theory? For me, what's interesting is to try and uh, try and examine how. Um, Structure and form, I mean, structure and content, or form, form and content, I mean, it's kind of like another kind of ongoing uh, question, but how structure is not divorced from content, structure is not simply a container uh, for the content, like any more than the mind and body uh, are like, distinct entities. Um, but the, the structure that something takes, like, influences the shape that it, the uh, content uh, takes and also the ways that people might approach that content or use it and these kinds of things. And likewise, um, the content begins to affect the, the, the structure as well. Why I'm interested in, in structure is because, is because they aren't deterministic. They don't, they don't determine what's going to happen. And all the, the, the projects uh, that, that you mentioned are things I think, you know, that I would think of, let's say, as platforms or something, in the sense that they have, um, uh, they involve uh, a lot of people, 
quite often, um, or more than just me. <laughs> and they also have a, a kind of, um, the, uh, the duration is not specified in advance, and what's going to happen with them isn't specified in advance. So they're experimental, yeah, in that way. Uh, and they have, they have that in common. And that, that is what's interesting to me, is, to, is, uh, is the production of situations where uh, we don't know what's going to, to happen. Um, and sometimes, yeah, when focusing on a work and you have a vision for what that work is going to be, and then all your work goes into realizing that, and of course you have sort of, you know, surprises along the way, but then you get to something that like surprisingly ends up like what you kind of imagined at the beginning, like that, yeah, that way of working doesn't doesn't really uh, interest me. I, I, I sort of become bored pretty early on in that process. Um, whereas the kind of um, uh, longer term thing where the initial conditions actually produce a situation that's that's a little unstable um, and therefore the, what happens is also kind of unpredictable and unstable. Um, to me this is this is about opening up uh, like other possibilities for uh, yeah for things as small as like, um, being together for a short time but also as big as you know, ways of living. Okay. So I would like to ask you for comments. I could suggest itself also to compare it to Ubu to a certain degree, but it's very obvious the differences. And I, th I found it very interesting, and that's what I also try to communicate with the selection. The really, the emphasis that it's not just a platform for, for download, but that it's kind of embedded in a larger, let's say, educational project and in, in a very kind of careful consideration of how form and content are related, which I didn't see so much you know, awareness about. Mm -hmm. <coughs> yeah, to, to go back to this, this idea of curation also. So for me it's not the difference between personal taste and some idea of a neutral, general or whatever, but it's and, and I heard a lot now about these kind of questions. It's quest, question, starting to question your own decision, your own choice. I mean, this is why we, we talk about um, gender, post-colonial, all these kind of issues in, in curating, right? I mean, how, how do you decide, how do you choice? Then, it's for me, also not a personal thing anymore. It's not do it, do it yourself, this kind of neoliberal idea. It's do it together, right? It's like, having a conversation with somebody else, then maybe you still come up with something like taste or something what we like or so, but, but you start to have a negotiation about that. So you were dealing with your own blind spots and these kind of things. And so, and, and it's a third one, a third point, which then for me in the curatorial context is more interesting, interesting is this, to say we, we are starting at a certain <coughs> question, but we don't know what is the aim actually. So, so it's about the process to coming somewhere and then to make decisions. And so these three points are, if we talk about, because this is also tomorrow the issue, uh, if we talk about curation in this context, then I see there the, 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 the interesting points to discuss actually. And John is back, so we can ask questions to him. <laughs> That's just a, a trick question for Sean. Uh, no, I was curious about your uh, form and content uh, connection to 
uh, structure. And I was wondering, uh, what is it, what specific, can you give an example of something specifically in the structures you work on uh, that allows this sort of um, instability in not defining beforehand what's going to happen? And so this excitement you talk about, like where form and content start to interplay. Since I didn't actually watch them, <laughs> I, don't, I don't know what you're referring to. Um, <laughs> but um, uh, and then, but since I just prepared my talk for tonight, <laughs> I'll, I'll use an example from that, so you can listen to it twice. Um, but like uh, in the uh, in the public school, we I don't know. For example, uh, uh, someone very early on proposed a class on the public school. Uh, which became a way of explaining the project, but it also ended up being like a, a, a place for, for uh, proposing like, alternative ways of it working. So it actually became a kind of workshop for restructuring the way that the, the, the project was run, like from a financial perspective, from a, like a curatorial perspective, and so on. So, I mean, to me, this is, uh, yeah, like, uh, but, but it actually happened sort of persistently through, I don't know if it was just the nature of the project or something, but it happened persistently through a lot of the classes, where, where the classes would, would start to, you know, whatever their subject matter, um, would start to reflect back on the, the, the structure, I mean, on, on the school as a whole, and that could uh, yeah, be integrated uh, back into the project in some way. Um, the, the same of the question um, Mr. Julie um, before uh, put the question of who has the right actually to put up these documents and make the curations and decide uh, in terms of copyright um, because uh, the copyright um, as was said in the videos was there to protect the artist um, and the intellectual output actually. And so, um, for me, it was really, really interesting as well to see, um, also in terms of the discussion we had with Marcel before, um, in terms of using uh, a structure that is already there and kind of repeating the same power system in a way to actually transfer the structure that you create and then giving um, also the other people the right to change and. Um, kind of form the way how to use it. So I thought in comparison to you and your project, it was very, I thought this is kind of the way we should go with these projects, putting them into a framework and making them legal in this way because people can kind of um, shape the way how they, how they want to use it. So I thought it was really, really good. larger uh, idea of this whole project to contextualize is to see that they share a certain, or to discuss basically the values that are embedded in those projects and at the same time see their difficult legal status and of course using kind of the values, values as a strategy to claim, you know, as a, a kind of defense strategy uh, for, for Ubu for example it would be, you know, it, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a cultural heritage project in a way, because he preserves a lot of things. Um, Marcel, it's kind of a tool in a self-organized educational context. So there's various strategies, you know, where these platforms are embedded, I think, which do exactly what you're suggesting. So for me, what is interesting, and again, like, um, occurred in, in this very event, is having, like, you know, like, the person who's here, and then, like, talking about with a very kind of HD image. Um, and that's also like in a way like uh, it questions or like it brings the question how you were getting into that and then these projects, whatever whatever is their kind of, uh, networking 
foundation, or topology, whatever is the social dynamics behind it, it still has a one talking head with a name and with kind of a personality which represents that. And then immediately you, you kind of try to guess what's behind and how much that talking head wants to stand in front or wants to go behind. And obviously Ken has no problem in standing in many ways in front of any project. Do you? Uh, from clothes to... Do you have any problem? Do I have? No, I think that I was also <laughs> thinking about it. Yeah, it's a, it's a, these are also different personalities, but also addressing the same problem of... Uh, uh, yeah, it's, it's complex. And then there, there is a serial behind it. But what I, what I realized is that then Ken is a poet, and it's a stereotype. A poet wouldn't really go if, 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 except he's shy. But if, if there is no shyness, then it just stands for with the name. It doesn't have that a big of a problem. And it can get into the discussion about the authorship and all of that. So, so it's just that, yeah, it's, it's not necessarily that because of standing with the name necessarily mean I support the whole mythology of the genius or whatever. But then when I was like watching your interview, Sean, I kind of, uh, I was reminded that Sean is architect and in a way, if you don't know what's the project, it could be easily architectural project, a new kind of approach to urban planning. And so it's the architect who kind of work on a place for himself with the others. Yeah. Uh, and, and I think that then there is kind of a, like a, kind of a sh being shy that, that it has to talk about it because talking without the context, the very context, it's kind of like, a, uh, it's, it's very hard, so I, I, I can recognize some of that kind of uh, uncanny uh, moments of that, and then you just reminded me by not watching it, and then again it goes well with what's going on uh, in, the, in the interview. So in that sense I would say that it's like a, how it looks like when a poet does it, and then how it looks like when a avant-garde architect does it, so then uh, it, it, it's very hard to avoid, I would say, these, um, these configurations. That's what's interesting uh, thing uh, there. Well, one thing that became clear to me is, maybe it was really when I started with also the, the naive desire to make interviews, you know, not really being aware what it means to kind of select this one talking head that then represents, but it turned out to be really interesting and complex also because the persons who usually initiate, even if they don't run it on their own, they initiate and have a, a certain driving role in the project, their personality has such a huge impact on the project itself but also how it's communicated and I think this whole situation here in the exhibition in the country is really about communicating those projects. So of course that's the interesting question. Yeah, but this makes me a little bit, uh, uh, I scares that. Because it's a, it's a very conservative perspective on the motivation to do something in a certain kind of a public sphere. It's this old tradition of art historical interpretation of the author ego coming here into the play. And I'm not very amused about it. Do you what exactly? Well, as a poet, the architect, I would say if there is a methodological approach in this, and this has to do with architecture, then there is a certain kind of a special practice. And it's a clearly a methodological approach. And maybe from there we could speak about a special practice and questions of different forms of representation. The subject and the representation of space, how it's used, like a little bit along this idea of Le Febre is doing that. But to refer to the aspect that the poet is putting something in a certain kind of way into the public, then we maybe should more discuss about that he is using PR uh, addressing strategies starting very much from the first page of Rubicon every time with, with uh, Beckett. Uh, and Beckett was one of the most missing links and sources uh, in the field of the image machinery around Beckett, etc., etc. So then I every time would looking for the methodological approach, but I don't would speculate about the persons. This is really old fashioned uh, art history. Uh, even, and I was working with a very, very, very strong 
personality two years together and I would say I learned from her methodologies and not from her strong personality. I partly agree but I think they're also related. I, I think that what we have here maybe is a problem that we are discussing these projects on the basis of representation which is through these videos and we kind of both decided like we, and we are so, somehow so clean and uh, that, that, that we almost did not focus or in some of it on uh, actually how they are discussing what they are doing and then discuss what does this mean with this topic that we are here gathered to discuss of uh, the infrastructures of knowledge and what the public library and the whole but we are kind of trying to categorize them as personalities and I think that these are actually in a way complementary but like I really like both projects but uh, ARC is a uh, Offering infrastructure, it's kind of offering of infrastructure, and it's offering a structure for me, it's really architectural, which uh, I'm an architect, uh, so I, I guess that I kind of feel this. And then it's also, I think, which we always focus on art, we cannot really, but I think it's we also have to see the art as, a, in, as part of this set where there is also public school which is also offering an infrastructure for the things that people did. Oh, oh, like we, people were always, uh, I obsess, I obsess, I obsess with, to share links and references and whenever someone tells me that they are working on something, it's like almost instantly a process goes through my head of going through the, all the people I know that are interested in the same things or the references and then oh, I have to look at this. And then art offers you to do this without, or, or like, it builds up also public school with the, in kind of offering an infrastructural support that if you want to start a course in your community, you can do that. You don't have to, which I really like that this existed when in 2008, when I started a, re, or I, I maybe it didn't exist and didn't know in Belgrade, I wanted to start a reading group on the city, which ended up by, you know, me sending emails to a couple of people, gathering at my home, blah, blah, blah. But it could not, when I left Belgrade, it could not, fall along because there was no infrastructure on which. So I think but there is a really entirely different offerings to the world, which I also think are really super important. But in order to discuss them, we have to go beyond whether, you know, I mean, it's so difficult with Kenneth because he's so seductive in the way he speaks. But I think that also we have to appreciate Ubu despite of Kenneth. <laughs> you know, we have to give him a credit. But also, uh, uh, and also to see how it, how it, because for a lot of people, like I grew up in Belgrade, so I grew up on a periphery of any cultural or, or art world. Not, uh, Ubu was this amazing place in which I could actually see some of the things that I only read about or discovered. And then, or as a complementary to that, then you can find found out about art and then you real and also public school which gives you kind of a curriculums or all these things and then you can start reading and then you see it because people make collections, <coughs> you see which texts are there and then through all these there's like a community that's built up. And I really think we have to discuss this in these quite issues and not the personality as No, but the question of course is I'm not saying that this, the personality is the ultimate entry point to it. I think it's just a small contribution, you know, to, to the larger discourse. And for me, these interviews, as I said in the beginning, uh, I, I think they should function really for people who are not part already of the insider circle to kind of provide knowledge and access to, to the existence of the project. So like an interface you know, to come in and find out about the existence. So maybe one last comment, Iris, do you want to say something? I think that, that I mean, the things how, how you use, how you deal with it, I mean, uh, because, of course, it's a great tool and I think it has uh, even a big impact on, on, on exhibitions because people could start to research work which you didn't see before. I mean, I had lots of these, these early avant-garde films, which you can see there. I, I saw the first time at Ubu because there was no other... Yes. 
and, and but now you, you almost have the feeling that this starts to get a certain kind of, of monopole, no? because you see certain works in exhibition and certain works not, and you should, it should be interesting to see the link to it. But this is the problem of the researcher and not of the one who is offering. And this is, as I understood, also one reason for Monoscope uh, to say there is, of course, what, what we become represents is a very Western idea of avant-garde art. And so, yeah. But but this is us to, to deal with it, and it's not a problem of. <laughs> well, because this this is something that uh, is continuing with my contribution before, because it's about public responsibility of the our patrimony, the public patrimony. I think that we will open a door, open a window to to get the responsibility. I think the institutions are very slow. To adapt and the thing, this is that you say there are many collections that you can now offer. A very old museum, so the Prado, or Mitach, or something they have, and they sell it a lot of art pieces. But then, when the digitalization starts, you can offer all these pieces to the public, and this is about public responsibility. That this, is, I think, many archivists now taking this transformation to offer everything that is our patrimony. It's our, uh, so, so this is more about public responsibility in most of the institutions to offer to the public all these pieces that they can offer. Because you can put the video, you can put a lot of photography, I think. Now it's an it's a economical question maybe, but this costs a lot of money to put all this patrimony there. The TV program, the all this public patrimony. But it's also a question of responsibility because some of this institution when to get money back, and they are controlling also this patrimony. So this is a kind of why. Okay, thanks everyone. Did you want to say something? Sean? Yeah, I didn't. Um... Oh. Um. <clears throat> I'm not sure if it's a, a helpful uh, sort of a distinction to make, but I, um, I read uh, an article recently or a couple of years ago by Russell Bell. It's about sharing, and he makes a distinction between uh, sharing in and sharing out. So sharing out would be the it's something that you might associate more with a gift. You know, it's a, you have something and you sort of uh, offer it to the other who doesn't who doesn't have it. Uh, whereas sharing in is a, is extending a boundary around a shared resource. So it's a um, basically comes like a form of collective property, so it's uh, extending the boundary to allow others in, and then it becomes theirs uh, as well. I just wonder if, like, um, um, I mean, he's, he's re re written this, um, the article mainly for the purpose of uh, marketing, like, that's the context in which the article is written, but it is sort of an interesting um, anthropological sort of study around sharing that he's done, and the, I, I found that distinction sort of helpful, maybe. Uh, especially with your project, since it's, I mean we're using words like offering, giving, and things like that. Okay, thank you, Sam. I think we move on to give enough time to our last project and artist, Femke Snelkin. Femke is an artist and designer living in Brussels. She develops projects at the intersection of design, feminism, and free software, thus investigating the intimate relationship between forum content and technology, or more specifically, the interrelations between digital tools and artistic practice. And is also there, suffering as well. Okay. Sean. Can you stay or you leave? <laughs> She's tough, she can stay. <laughs> Femke is involved in various contexts that make her part of, of different configurations of we. There is the Association Constant, based in Brussels, which is an interdisciplinary arts lab and active since 1997. The artistic practice of Constant is inspired by the way that technological infrastructures, data exchange, and software determine our daily life. Free software, copyright alternatives, and cyberfeminism are important threads running through the activities of Constant. Constant organizes work sessions, meetings, publications, and other events for participants that are into experiments, discussions, and all kinds of exchanges. 
Another we constitutes open source publishing, a group of graphic designers that uses only free software tools, only free software tools. I was pretty <coughs> serious about testing the possibilities and limitations of open source software in a professional design environment and is prepared to make new and unexpected experiences. Femke is an associated member of this group. Ecographics is the larger context that Femke takes part in. This ecosystem consists of graphic designers, programmers, free software tools, open document formats and practices of sharing and reflecting, which applies the thinking and philosophy of free software to graphic design practice. The title of this interview, Performing Graphic Design Practice, indicates that adopting free software tools and philosophy for the design context may turn out to be a rather artistic endeavor. Getting into direct contact with the developers of the software used and working together with them, getting to know one's tools inside out, ensuring an unimpeded circulation of cultural artifacts by the use of free and libre licenses, freeing the alphabet from proprietary enclosures, and using open, open document formats means producing artifacts that can contain within themselves the layered reality of digital materiality and at the same time are nothing but a point of connection in a net of shared practices. Art here comes into play as a reference system for integrating practice and discourse beyond the usability paradigm. Libographics is, uh, is quite a, a large ecosystem of software tools, of people, people that develop these tools, but also people that use these tools, uh, practices, like how do you then work with them, not just how do you uh, make things quickly and, and um, uh, in, a, in an impressive way, but also how these tools might change your practice. and. Uh, the cultural artifacts that result from it. So it's it's all these elements that come together. I would call them libre graphics. The term libre is is uh, chosen deliberately. Um, it's slightly more mysterious than the term free, especially when it uh, turns up in the English language. Um, it sort of hints that there's there's something uh, different. There's something um, done uh, on purpose. Um, and uh, it's a group of people that are, uh, are inspired by a free software culture, by free culture, by thinking about how to share both their tools, their recipes, uh, and the outcomes of all this. So, Lingua Graphics is quite um, wild, it, it goes in many directions, um, but it's an interesting um, context to work in uh, that for me has been quite inspiring for a few years now. And so we worked on a code of conduct, uh, which is something that uh, seems to appear in, in, in free software or tech conferences more and more. It comes a bit from the uh, US context. Uh, where uh, we have started to understand that the fact that uh, free software is free doesn't mean that everyone feels welcome. And um, for long there, had, there and still are uh, large problems with diversity in this community. Um, the, the, the excitement about freedom has led people to think that people that were not there uh, would probably not want to be there and therefore had no role to be there. And so if you think about, for example, the fact that uh, there's very little, that there's not a lot of women, women active in free software, a lot less than in proprietary software, which is quite painful if you think about it, that has to do with this sort of 
um, cyclical effect of because when they are not there, they will probably be not interested, and because they're not interested, they might not be capable or feel capable of being, um, uh, let's say, active and, and um, yeah, and feel, they feel they might not belong. So that's one part. The other part is that there's there's a very brutal uh, culture of harassment, of uh, racist and sexist language, of using imagery that is, uh, uh, let's say, unacceptable, um, and that needs to be dealt with. And so, over the last two years, I think, the documents like a code of conduct have started to come up from, from feminists active in this world, like Geek Feminism or, or the other in initiative, as a way to deal with this. Um, and what it does, is it describes uh, in a bit, let's say, slightly pompous in the sense that you describe your values, uh, but it is a way to acknowledge the fact that these communities have a problem with harassment first, that they explicitly say we want diversity, which is important, that uh, it gives very clear and practical um, guidelines for what someone that feels harassed can do, who he or she can speak to, and what will be the consequences. Meaning that it takes away the burden from, well, at least as much as possible, from someone that is harassed to defend, actually, the, the gravity of the case. So for me, uh, calling myself an artist um, is useful, it's very useful. Uh, I'm not so busy with the, let's say, the institutional art context, that doesn't help me uh, at all. But what does help me is the figure of the artist, uh, the kinds of intelligences <coughs> that I sort of project on myself and I, learn, I, 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 I use from others and my colleagues before uh, and contemporary, because it allows me to not have too many um, to be able to define my own context and concepts without forgetting practice. And I think art is one of the rare um, places that allows this, not only allows it, but actually Rigor rigorously asks for it. It is really uh, wanting me to be explicit about uh, my histor historical connections, my way of making, my references, my um, choices uh, that are part of, of the situation I built. And so the figure of the artist is uh, very useful toolbox in itself. Um, and I think I use it more than, than I would have thought. Uh, because it, yeah, it allows me to make these cross connections uh, in, a, in a productive way. Okay. So there's two Part, I think the one is the code of conduct, which uh, I think we should bring up. So maybe, oops. Okay, first thing is the code of conduct, and I would like to ask Pampi to just give a little bit, because that may be a little bit surprising, because everything, you know, we celebrated free culture before, and the culture sharing, and all of a sudden it comes such negativity. 
you know, harassment and lack of diversity into this fantastic world. So, would you like to tell us a little bit about the background, why you thought it's necessary to create this code of conduct? Um, uh, is, yeah, this was a group decision, uh, although it was not an easy dis decision, with lots of resistance. Um, and I wonder actually whether we have a code of conduct at this point, uh, because at the last detail, um, it was not finished process. Uh, so to even add another com complication, uh, part of um, so uh, maybe I start somewhere else. Uh, these types of documents are unfortunately the f the one and only thing we can think of uh, to maybe bring up these issues. Uh, and so the problem is that once you bring them up, you have to deal with them. Uh, and so there's a lot of discussion then coming up that uh, you might not uh, be waiting for because I'm more interested in excited projects and working together with other people on you know, creating new, uh, new work uh, than to be confronted with the question, so what, what types of harassment have you experienced then? <laughs> and um, so you're saying in our community we need this type of code of conduct. Can you list me a few people that have had problems and can they speak out and say what happened? Because then we can deal with it. So it's a, it's a toxic process. I'm not sure. I have many doubts about if this is the right you know, process. Uh, but it's very clear that something uh, has to happen. Uh, because, yeah, these communities grow. Uh, there's in these communities many types of we. Uh, and so then the question of we do things because we like them uh, might be very have di very different answers to very different people. So you get complicated additional work that needs to be done uh, to keep uh, this 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 type of production sane and also pleasurable. So I think it's an important statement, at least to kind of try to make the attempt to 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 write such a code of conduct, even if it's not finished, if it's not in place, you know, it's just because of the fact that it's pointing to certain uh, problems and uh, addressing them, I think, is, is absolutely necessary. Any comments on feelings? direction but um, I mean something we did not talk about at all now is um, what means knowledge no? I mean uh, there, there's a certain way of positivist knowledge which can be very dangerous I mean we talk about um, um, it, 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 exclusion you could also say but the more the Western world knew about the foreign the, 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 the alien um, the more they could exploit I mean so, so there is something of positive knowledge which is very dangerous and I like very much, for example, like Pedro Hiromiro who is dealing very much with, with the flamenco culture and he's saying how the flamenco people were lying and anthropologists. I mean, so, so this idea of lying because you, you must be very, in, in certain moments you must be very, very careful with your knowledge because it can be very dangerous if other people know it, you know what I mean? So this is what we did not talk at all right now. We, we say that this is a knowledge is like something very positive, something very we all want to share. But there is maybe also a reason to lie or to hide knowledge or to, to yeah. Yeah, I think that's a difficult big other topic which we cannot cover <laughs> within this session. Here it is, which will be next year when we are speaking about authorship. Obfuscation will be one of the topics exactly this week. Mm. <laughs> Next year, then. Let's <laughs> wait. <laughs> it's okay if there's no other comment on, on this on the gender issue and the code of conduct. Um, I think it's important that we keep it in mind that it's
kind of like a parallel layer, you know, where I would also, if you look at the, at the works here, at the uh, gender relation in the exhibition, you know, to have, to have it just in mind that there is, that there is an issue that needs to be actively addressed. Mentioned there is now like a quite a current story going on with the uh, names. Here's a bit, huh? Yeah, Gamer Gate and her name is up. Uh, so, a woman was for years doing a great um, feminist analysis of video games, plots, and, and things like that, and then it got like a, a, got some kind of recognition, and then also it, after it got recognized. Uh, just during that process, uh, people started to harass yeah, her and the whole story, and then in some way it also uh, gave some attention that's how it goes. Uh, so many people heard about the project also because of some of the early reactions, but uh, uh, lately it just became like a ridiculously dangerous yeah, because because that's right. I think that that's uh, in, in, in some way also it shows that how the abstraction, how abstracting, how the virtual, how the like uh, how to how that kind of um, uh, moving and distancing the material world from the virtual, it's kind of it, it gets into that kind of scale where it's not uh, controllable anymore, and in some ways the kind of part of the. Like very small part of the justification of what they do is just that it's all kind of mutual, you know, like that, that it's it's kind of the very flexible, very liberal use of a, of a metaphors of the language and things like that. But that at the end, it's absolutely not. It's the worst of uh, of the concrete and material harassments, and yeah, it's, uh, it's always here. And these days, it's it's even like uh, it has a story with. Uh, yeah, almost like a Hollywood plot in a way. The second point that Femke addressed in, in the interview was really kind of her use of the term art or the concept of art that she uses like to integrate her different interests, her you know, what she does as a graphic design a graphic designer to kind of question her tools, understand the tools and, and kind of looking into production conditions and all that, and I think that would bring me back to what we, you know, indicated in the beginning, the question, why do, why do the, the projects that we see here, the artworks, why do, what do they need the art context for, why do they need to be in an exhibition, or why does the art context need those sort of projects and what for. Uh, one concept that Marcel mentioned last night it was making visible, does this have something to do with making visible and communicating, but I don't know, maybe the curators, who are the curators? I think that would probably be a nice moment to, to a little bit add to the storytelling of how this exhibition, how the idea was born and how, what the discussion process was of bringing this into an art space. So, uh, guest for it, so to I, and the question is of giving space for a certain kind of uh, uh, structure which is organized basically uh, along different interactivities. Um, so, uh, hmm? Okay, uh, so it's, it's also, uh, it's, it would be an interesting question Laura to discuss uh, what else came, came into the landscape of the art institution with this form uh, of art production. And I think what, what came back as, as a tool very, very much, like one example, is the culture of sharing, uh, community meeting and workshop as a tool. Uh, and the workshop as an artistic form in and really like in a physical space. So I would uh, maybe turn the question also a little bit around what, what new things appears under this structure of representation which, from which you first would say because it exists in a, in a different space like one example the internet it doesn't need this form of representation uh, so you have to request your institutional practice along this form of uh, 
a space which can be represented in a space which is an art institution. But it still makes the space of the art institution valuable uh, if it's at one example an intelligent, useful container for the structure of workshop. So I think it's, 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 the landscape is much bigger than to only uh, request uh, the position of, of, of the art institution as we would see them in a traditional form. They also change by this development. I think the question was kind of based on the concept of art, you know, of which the institution is just one component. The other question for me that I mentioned in the beginning is well, I'm interested in looking at what kind of art is, you know, what sort of art is it that we're looking at. And you say it, it takes place in a different space anyway, which is the internet. There's the structures, the infrastructures, the digital tools and all that. But I found thinking about the projects, they all have a different component, another component, which is kind of the, the discursive element, because they are not just there functioning somewhere, but there are people who speak about it, there are texts about being written, there is like the new project where you, you know, which is about narratives and storytelling. So for me, that's part of it. So it's not just only the, the pure functionality, you know, but it has this component. So that it's both part of the project and probably that's also the part you don't need to reproduce the functionality in the art space, but you know, for the second part, for the discursive part, the, the art context, art institution is a, is a useful environment. Yeah, I'm also not the curator of this exhibition. <laughs> but, uh, is there a curator in this exhibition? <laughs> but um, but the, the, the important thing for, for me is that, that, that we are always talking about the constant re recontextualization. <laughs> <laughs> no, but the, for me, the, 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 the important aspect is this recontextualization of, of works. I mean, or you have this different from, from people to art to uh, monoscope. Maybe you find the same books, but you find them in a different context. This is a sort of rereading of things. And this is why, why I think um, this accessibility is so important and that every work uh, doesn't. Uh, it's any loss if it is used by other people because there is something which it gets back, no? Because it gets, uh, gets recontextualized, and this is—it doesn't matter if it is recontextualized in another ar online archive or in an exhibition or or in a book about something where it is quoted, which is very basic. Well, some people would still have certain requirements when it comes to an artwork in an exhibition. <laughs> uh, well. Coming back to your initial question, uh, art <coughs> and commons, I think that there is a tenuous relationship uh, in the art for now at least two centuries between a uh, process of commodification and decommodification because simply art um, lives and functions in a reality that has a certain uh, structure of economic relations and it itself is uh, immersed in them. And I think that much of, of so if we look at this from the perspective uh, of Massimo de Angelis' um, definition of what commons are, I think it's relatively clear what, um, what the need is um, and, uh, and what the processes of commoning are. It's, I think what, what the discussion has focused mostly is on who is the agent of doing that. Now, is it an individual? Is it an institution? Is it a community? Is it a collectivity? Can we speak at all in terms of um, uh, personalities uh, to understand uh, how these individual projects are uh, achieving something and what is the capacity that uh, tactical and practical capacity that acting as an individual allows as opposed to acting uh, as an institution. I think that in that, in, in, in speaking in those terms, uh, I would say that <coughs> presenting public library uh, in uh, the context of uh, the art gallery, it allows to create uh, a certain form of visibility, public recognition, legitimation, uh, in a somewhat safe 
uh, zone uh, in social context, uh, but still um, uh, there is uh, an element to uh, to public library where uh, it could come to a legal contestation and it could come uh, um, well to legal reprisals. Uh, and I think that it's it would be a shame if this happens at a low level of visibility. So I think uh, part of the instrumental value of presenting this in the gallery is that there is a long list uh, what social institutions stand behind these processes of decommodification in order to have uh, a high level of um, legal debate uh, should and once uh, it comes to that. You know, that would be maybe a, a practical way to answer, answer your question. Maybe much of it. Uh, yeah, I, uh, what I was interested um, is um, is kind of to address the, let's call it petit bourgeois cognitive dissonance today, <laughs> where that's kind of a denial, you know, like of not facing some obvious things. For example, like a smoking marijuana, but we don't do that here. But that's one example of the. If you want. Of not, yeah, I mean, we didn't do that here. Just trying to make another example of a petit bourgeois cognitive dissonance, you know, they don't know how to, the society in a way doesn't know how to deal with that and most of the, whatever, the people who can articulate, they are like already there. So they smoke or they don't have, don't have any problems in smoking dog uh, and yeah, whatever. So in, in this particular case, there is another cognitive dissonance and that's about the practice and practicing things or like social interactions on the internet. So for quite some time, uh, it's like illegal and everybody do that. So then there is only one benefit of that and that's the, the control structure which can cherry pick anyone and say you are criminal because there is no one in the society who is not doing that. Except people who are, let's say, boring or because of some other reasons <laughs> in unfortunate situations and they should do that. So it's not that, uh, yeah, they are discriminated maybe by, by some other mechanisms but if they are not, then they are boring. Um, so, so in that sense, what I was interested in is like, what's the role of the institutions? Because I realized that uh, telling my story about public library and telling that story with like, a few others, that it goes great. People resonate with that, they celebrate that, and that's not something which is like new. I mean, there was a, unfortunately we forgot to mention there is a public library exhibition like 10 years ago. People were doing that like, Quite for, for quite some time. But what I was interested in is like why these institutions are so happy to cost us, but they will never like really go for that. So that's the kind of a small contribution which I appreciate, but at the same time I'm interested in the general conditions of what can be done because what's what we are doing unfortunately because of that cognitive dissonance is the illegal activities and that's the civil disobedience. And in order to get into the proper civil disobedience, it needs to be articulated. Because not every illegal activity, even if it's okay, is not, it's not a civil disobedience. For that, you need to, to do some kind of a political articulation. And that's, that was the kind of one of the initial ideas, a civil disobedience and institutions. And then I asked uh, Mr. Jolie to talk about that controversial moment of the Hermann's library. Is that the censorship or not? Then also I was a fellow there, so how, how that institute, how how it deals with that, you know, because it's it's kind of also the result of proper danger. If I did something bad, I mean police would come, you know, whatever, and say like, why are you doing these terabytes of illegal activities? And then another one was here that this is a good kind of uh, hosting place because it was already hosting Stuttgart 21, so it, it kind of resonates what I what I expect from the institution, and that the institution can articulate it <coughs> in that particular uh, context when hosting a civil disobedience. This is kind of initial, uh, initial idea how we started, but then of course many things changed because we couldn't get, I, I think that if Markus Krajewski came, then it would get you know, a little bit more of the media theory background. If, you know, it depends on who's here with the final 
very specific uh, uh, yeah, particular kind of uh, story. And here the story is the result of that kind of initial idea and a lot of discussions, but also a lot of uh, what we could do, you know, what was available in that sense. And that's unfortunate for every event that we can't get everything we want. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So thanks a lot. Um, I think it's time to wrap up and say thank you, especially to the artists who contributed uh, to my project and who are present today and everyone who made it possible. Thank you.